reading from the book of Luke chapter 15. We we'll read from verse 11. Luke 15 from verse 11. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that followed to me, and the divided unto them is living. Is living. It's very important that you understand that it was not his inheritance. Is living. Is living. I need you to put that at the back of your mind. Not many days after, the younger son <clears throat> gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with righteous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with, husk, with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave to him. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me, one of, make me as one of the hired servants. And he arose, came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on him, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now, understand the concept of that scripture. A certain man had two sons. Life has two sides. A certain man has two sons. That tells us, interpretedly, that life has two sides. In life, you see, God said something when he was trying to qualify himself. In Isaiah chapter 55, if you read verse 8 and verse 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, neither are, my, are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts, and my ways than your ways. So God says, I operate in two dimensions, thoughts, ways. God clearly defined his expressive you know, ability on man. How he guides man, how he relates with man, are two, are two, two dimensions, thoughts and ways. Thoughts and ways. If you can understand the mystery of thoughts and the mystery of ways. In other words, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. So it is the thoughts that determines the ways. It is the thoughts that determines the way. Don't forget what the Bible says in Genesis 11, the last part of verse 6. He said, and not we be restrained from them which they have imagined to do, the thoughts, to do the ways. But it begins with the thoughts. Not we be restrained from them. That's why I say to people that the biggest nation in the world is not America, it's not Europe, it's not Canada. The biggest nation in the world is the mind. And that's why it's called imagination. When you think, you form image. When you think, you form pictures. Okay? So when God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. So God's dimension in relating with all is through thinking and ways. Don't forget in Proverbs 23 verse 7, he said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, as he thinketh in his heart. So before we take steps, it has to come through imagination. We have to think before steps. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12, the Bible said there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end are the ways of death. He repeated the same thing in Proverbs 16, 25, I believe. There was a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end are the ways of death. Before we take ways, there must first of all be thoughts. Okay, so life has two sides. Just the way when Joseph was interpreting the dream for Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, 
I saw certain cattle that were looking so plumpy. They emerged out of the sea. And later I saw seven tiny cattle. And these seven tiny cattle swallowed the very fleshy cattle. And that was what Joseph said to him. That is life. Life has two sides. Joseph said the seven speaks of duration, the number of years. And the seven fat cows speaks of abundance, the years of abundance. The seven tiny cows speak of the year of famine. If you don't handle the year of abundance, the year of famine will swallow the year of abundance. That is what life is. Life has got two sides. Life leaves you with options. And that is why you must be very careful. Because when there are so many options, if you are not guided, you will make mistakes in life. A man had two sons. The story of, the, um, of this young man, the Bible used the word younger son, speaks of immaturity. Younger son. I'm not going to talk of spiritual immaturity. I'm going to talk of maturity. Because I'm going to get into immaturity. We are going to spend a whole lot. Three, four days we are still here. But I want to talk about maturity. Maturity is after he came back. His process of coming back. Okay. He said, The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion that falleth to me. Give me the portion. Now, we understand from what we read that this old story, before I start picking out the points at the proof of maturity, tells us about how God daily waits for the sinner. If you study your Bible, this young man said, I will go back to my father. I will return back to my father. And the Bible says, while he was coming, the father saw him afar off. Afar off. The father saw him afar off. When the father saw him come, the father met him. He said, the father, great way off. The father saw him, that's what I see on the screen. Great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Great way off. Now, for you to see somebody from a distance, it means you have been waiting for that person. You have been daily coming out to check out for that person. Now, listen to this. No matter how merciful God is, He will show you mercy until you ask Him for it. God daily waits for the sinner. It's a proof to us that God every day is waiting for you to just call. He's waiting for you to just reach out to Him and just say, Lord, help me, save me, strengthen me. I can't do this by myself. I can't do this on my own. I need help. And God is going to help you. The sum total of the story also showed us the mystery of domestic wickedness. This also shows us, the story also shows us the mystery of domestic wickedness. His problem was not even external. His problem was internal. Because when he came home, the brother resisted him. The best thing that happened to this young man was that when he came to his senses, his father was still alive. If his father was dead before he realized himself, then his realization would have come to naught because the elder brother would have prevented him from having access. The elder brother here speaks of a concept of people who have become too, who have been so religious and have become too familiar with spiritual matters. The word elder here speaks of the religious sect of people who have been so much in the house and they have become too familiar. They have become too natural. Not humanity, that's different, but naturality. I'm going to be explaining all of that as we go on. So we see that from the, from the Bible that this young man was having issues and he ran into lack. It also tells us that there is no scarcity in God. Peace is in abundance. Joy is in abundance. Life is in abundance. In God there is no scarcity. That's what the story tells us. That in God we have no scarcity. Okay? So it's very important that we understand that. When he returned back, he left the house. When he returned back to the house, we're going to pick something out. When he was in the father's house, there was something that kept pulling him to leave. Something kept telling him to leave. And when he was to return now, when he was now grown, by reason of what he saw outside, he took certain decisions. Okay? While he was inside, he took a decision. While he was outside, he took a decision that was now matured and brought him back. So how, when was the growth process? While he went outside. 
while he was hungry, while he was, he was alone, while he was abandoned, he was forsaken. So the challenges of life, of life that comes our way as believers are meant to mature us. Okay? They are meant to mature us. They are meant to make us mature. That is why no believer says I'm suffering. What they say is that I'm growing. Because as you go through the battles of your life, you begin to grow. It helps you to see God in a different light. It makes you understand God and love Him the more. The challenges of life should not make you, as a seed of God, should not make you sit back and whimper in regret and in pain and self-defeat. No, but rather to say to God, I love you. And because the Bible says He sees the end from, his, from the beginning. His ways are past finding out and there is no searching to His understanding. He has thought for you. In Psalm 139 verse 17, he said, how precious are thy thoughts towards me. Great is the sum of them. God thinks, for, for, you know, he has, he has an agenda for your life. Great is the sum, the total of them. Jeremiah 29, 11, popular verse of scripture. The Bible says, I know the thoughts I think towards you. Sort of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Another translation says, to give you a future and a hope. So God has got an agenda for your life. He's got a plan. The Bible says, in, okay, this message version, I know what I am doing. I like this. God says, I know what I am doing. I have it all planned out. Oh, cap, aliade, sorash. It's a plan to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. You should never get to a point in your life where you think that God has abandoned or left you alone. Okay, so we discover that God waits for the sinner. As we study the scripture, we're going to consider the first proof of maturity. When he came back, he was desirous of his father. He said, I return home. Now, he could have sent a mistress home. He could have sent people to go and talk to his father. But he said, no, I am going. The first proof of spiritual maturity is passion for divine presence. I want to go back to my father's house. I'm going back there. I will say to him, I've sinned. Passion for his presence. I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. You see, anytime you are out of God's presence, you are released to the worst. Anytime God's presence lifts up from a man, that man is released to the worst. You remember Genesis chapter 4 verse 6? Okay, you remember Genesis 4 verse 6? And Genesis 4 verse 16? We see what happened to the young man called Cain. Verse 6, God questioned him. Verse 16, the Bible says he went out of the presence of God. And that was when he killed his brother. Now, something happened in the study of the Bible when Moses was speaking to the Lord. In Genesis, in Exodus 33, not Genesis, Exodus 33, verse 14 and verse 15. Exodus 33, verse 14 says, God gave them an assurance. He said, my presence will go with you. When he goes with you, you have rest. And Moses told him, verse 15, if your presence will not go with us, don't bother carrying us. Because we know that when your presence is with us, your presence engulfs and overwhelms and envelops us. Then we are preserved. One of the signs a believer is, is, is getting matured or a sign of maturity as a believer is you are so hungry for divine presence. You are hungry for fellowship. Have you got to that point in your life when you have not had a quiet time, you are restless? It's a proof of maturity. You wake up in the morning, you are talking to your friends, something tells you you have not had a quiet time. Something tells you you, you need to pray. And I tell believers all the time, when you start feeling that restlessness, do it right there. Don't procrastinate, don't procrastinate, don't postpone. It's okay. Before the end of the day, I'm going to pray. No. When you feel like praying, pray. When the passion comes for you to pray, take out time, pray. Don't say you're going to pray at the end of the day. I'm going to pray at night. I'm going to wake up and pray tomorrow. No. Pray right there. Passion for divine presence. And I've talked about the Holy Spirit. I've talked about how to attract the presence of God. And I told you one of the places is environment matters, location matters. Take out time. And that's when you begin to seek God. You are hungry for the presence of God. I'm going to say something that um, if you are not really mature, you won't understand this. 
To get to God, most times you must get, you must get away from people. To get to God, most times you must get away from people. And that's why the higher you go in the spirit, the fewer your friends. The higher you go in the spirit, the fewer friends you have. As you grow in the spirit, your friends begin to drop. That's the truth. That's the truth. When there are still so much of them, so not because they are not good people, but somehow you are at a level and at a realm in life where you, you, you don't have a common ground. You can't hold a conversation because the things you are passionate about, the things your heart panted for, are not the things their heart is panting for, are not the things they are passionate about. So you can't hold a conversation. The very people you spend time on the phone with, all of a sudden when they are, they are talking to you, you are so bored because your heart is indicting a good matter. You are passionate about something different than they are passionate about. His presence. The first thing about the presence of God is that the presence of God gives joy. Psalm 16, 11. Thou will show me the path of life for in thy presence there's fullness of joy. And at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. Once you, you, just, you just see yourself excited, not happiness. The fruit of the Spirit is not happiness. Okay, Happiness is a function of happenings. Happenings, events, money comes to your hand, you are happy. Meaning that that is, you know, triggered by an event. You just bought a car, you are smiling, you are happy. You just built a house, you are happy. But joy is by the Holy Spirit, by the presence of God. And that's what the Bible says in Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and joy and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You, you just you don't have money in your pocket, but you are smiling, you are excited. You have nothing with you, but you are excited. The presence of God is a proof of the Spirit. Once you have the Spirit of God, the evidence is that you enjoy the presence of God. Psalm 51 11, it said, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit. From me is a proof of the spirit. There's an overwhelming assuring, assuring, you know, assurance that you have when you have the presence of the Lord. Number three, the presence of the Lord gives you security. The Bible says in Isaiah 63, verse 9, the angel of his presence saved us. The angel, yeah, the angel of his presence saved them. In his love, in his pity, he redeemed them. So once you have the presence of God, you begin to enjoy strange and uncommon security. And no, don't forget, I told you, one of the proof of maturity is divine presence. And one of the proof that you have the presence of God is that you begin to enjoy maturity, you begin to enjoy security, you begin to enjoy uh, uh, abundance, as it were. You know, when um, Adam, when Adam sinned, one of the things we noticed that Adam did was Adam sinned. Adam, Adam saw himself afraid. Afraid. Genesis 3, 9, 10. What are thou? He said, I hid myself. Because I was afraid. I was naked. Meaning the presence of God had lifted from Adam. So when God's presence is out of your life, you lack security. You become empty. That's the anointing, the presence of the Holy Spirit that comes upon a man and in the face of confrontation, there is this security he had. Something happened some time ago. I was living in a house. I used to stay somewhere. And um, I, I think there was no light. There was, the, 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 there was no power. There was power outage. And I opened the front door. So I lay down in the living room. And I had arm robbers rubbing in the next flat. And you know, they said to the, to the people, where does that pastor live? Where does the pastor live? And the people said, he's in the next flat, he's in the next flat. So somebody sneaked from behind and called me. He said, please lock your door, they are coming. I said, no problem, no problem. I heard them. I lay down on that couch and I slept off. I didn't know where I slept off. I woke up, the door was still open, nobody could enter. And I asked myself a question. Am I okay? 
I had robbers on their way to this flat and I slept. There was this overwhelming assurance I had that I am untouchable. It was just, it was indescribable. I just, I said, oh, I, I heard them. You go, you go, go, I heard them. He said, please, I lock the door. I said, no problem. Now, I had the intention to stand up, lock the door. I had that intention to do that. I mean, I wasn't trying to tempt the Lord. I had the intention. But I just, I just, I looked at the door and I just, okay, I slept off. When I woke up, it was, the day was bright. And they said, so you left this door open? They went round everywhere. They could not. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. But there was an overwhelming presence of God that gave me security. It was the presence of God. Okay. So it's very important that we understand what the presence of God can give. If you have that presence, it gives you, number one, like I said, the presence of God gives you joy. The presence of God gives you security. The presence of God is a proof of your relationship with the Holy Spirit. All right. So we see the presence of God guides you. The presence of God guides you. The presence of God guides you. You see, one of the problems that the prodigal son lacked was a lack of guidance. Nobody talked to him. Nobody instructed him. And that's what people don't know. Galatians 4 verse 1 says, The hair, so long as a child, does not differ from a servant. Though he is the Lord of all. He has to remain on that teacher's and tutors until the time appointed of the father. So long as a child, he has no access to precious matters. So long as a child, there is a, there is a level and a realm he cannot access until he's grown. Why does he have to stay on that teacher's and tutors? He stays on that teacher's and tutors so he is taught. He is tutored. And that leads to growth. Nobody to guide him. Nobody to instruct him. And that's the generation we live in. We live in a generation when people feel you don't need anybody to, to tell you anything. The Bible calls it a perverted generation. An adulterous generation. When people tell you you don't need a pastor. You say man of God. I say what about you? Are you not a man of God? But in scripture the Bible calls people man of, man of God. So are you trying to say the, the Bible is wrong? Why didn't Scripture called everybody a man of God. He said to some, he gave apostles. To some, he didn't say to all. To some, he gave teachers. But when people try to use logic to interpret scriptures, they make you feel you don't need any form of guardians. You don't need guardians. And look at our world today. Is it becoming better or is it becoming worse? So you don't need anybody to pray for you. Pray for yourself. You don't need anybody to, 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 to intercede for you. You can intercede. We all have the same access to God. Of course we do have the same access to God. <laughs> Listen, let me say this to you. The presence of God can be... We all have access to God. We all have access to the presence of God. But there is something called the manifest presence of God. Okay, the Shekinah glory of God. No, we all have access to God. So why do we need special... special? Don't you all have access to football? Why do we go to the stadium? We all have access to football. We all have access to the classroom. We all have access to books, rather. So why do we go to the classroom? Access to buying from the shop. Why do we go to the marketplace? Don't let anyone fool you. Have, it. have a scriptural relationship with God. Okay? There were prophets in scriptures. That, now, don't get me wrong. There can be people who are making nuisance of the calling of God. There are people that are making mess. That does not deny reality. That there is a bad government does not deny the fact that you need the government. Okay? So don't let that bother you. That there is a bad wife doesn't deny the fact that you need to get married. So don't let people prescribe a drug that is more dangerous than the disease. I'll just take this time off and I'll come back to talk to you again on the concluding part of spiritual maturity. And maybe hear a few testimonies if there are some and then I'll pray with you. I'll be with you after this time out.